thank the Kellogg Hubbard Library and the League for sponsoring this panel. Last year, the League sponsored a similar panel on race and policing. Well, a lot has happened this year. And tonight, our panelists will address what we've learned about racial disparities in Vermont and next steps that are needed. We are honored to have three very accomplished, knowledgeable, and committed advocates for reform in the criminal and juvenile justice system. We have Professor Stephanie Seguino, a professor from UVM. She has a PhD in economics, and she has a very impressive and long resume. So I'll just pick a few highlights. Uh, she has an international presence. She's taught in South Africa. She worked in Haiti. She's worked with USAID. She's worked with the UN and the World Bank, just to name a few. Fortunately for us in Vermont, Stephanie teaches in Vermont and she recent, recently completed a comprehensive five-year analysis and study of car stops and race. So we will have the opportunity to hear her speak about that uh, study and others that she's doing. Also joining us tonight is Rebecca Turner, who is a supervising appellate attorney for the Office of the Defender General, a former immigration attorney, and a current member of the advisory panel uh, on racial disparities in the criminal justice system, which I believe was established by the legislature. Um, she's going to explain their recent work and a report and ideas for recommendation. And we're also very fortunate to have Sarah George, who is the Chittenden County State's Attorney. Sarah runs the office that basically handles the majority of Vermont's criminal and juvenile cases. Um, she's on the front lines of these issues every day. She's gonna address race and policing and the juvenile justice system from a prosecutor's point of view. So I will be monitoring your questions. And now I think we'd like to hear from Professor Seguino. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate everybody's interest in this topic. And I'm so delighted to be here with um, Sarah George and Rebecca Turner, who are just uh, really models in terms of addressing these issues in Vermont. And uh, nationally, Sarah has become known nationally for some of the work she's done. So I thought what I'd do is just start out by talking about where we are today, because we're going to talk about what the opportunities are for, for reform and what directions we might go in. And what I thought I would do is share with you just a little bit of our recent study that came out. Um, we, it, for those of you who are not familiar with this, the legislature in, uh, around 2013 required all law enforcement agencies to collect traffic stop data by race. And the purpose was to uh, identify racial disparities in policing. This work had originated uh, actually in the Chittenden County because the community of color had, um, had voiced their concerns for quite some time about bias in policing and in particular driving while black. And they began to collect, uh, collect data voluntarily and some of the earlier studies that came out of that showed that there were racial disparities. And I think that may have been what propelled the legislature to require all law enforcement agencies to collect these data. So when we did an initial analysis of this data in 2017, we only had one year's worth of data, which is not much for, uh, especially because uh, many of our towns are small and we need large sample sizes, but also many towns didn't submit their data. But here we are five years later, and uh, we now have data from all 79 agencies in the state. And it's allowed us to um, compare and contrast. We've also been able to look at what's been the impact of cannabis legalization in Vermont during this period of time. So I just want to show you a little bit of a few of our results here. Uh, one of the things that was really striking in this uh, data was that nationally, the number of um, stops per 1,000 people is around 86. So around 8.6% 8 
of the resident population nationally is stopped in car stops a year. So even leaving aside the issue of, um, of racial disparities, what we find in Vermont is that the police in general overstop all drivers relative to the national average. So you can see here some of the, the larger communities, um, Bennington, Brattleboro and so forth. And you can see how, just how much higher their stop rates are compared to the national average. I mean, literally in Bennington, almost seven to eight times greater than the national average and decreasingly. In fact, it's only Burlington that stops at a rate lower than the national average. And a few years ago, they really, they, their stops have decreased by 60% because they made that decision to do so and have found that it's had no negative effect, effect on public safety. So I think it's a really interesting discussion about what, do, what, what policing should be, what police should be doing and the extent to which they should be intrusively stopping vehicles because it is an intrusion. And I have to say that uh, in some cases, they were not really even the worst. If you look here, uh, Richmond, Vermont st stops uh, almost 4,000 drivers per 1,000 stops. Uh, Milton, 2,000 drivers per 1,000 residents. Uh, and Hinesburg, Castleton, and so forth. So many agencies overstop generally. Uh, but, the, but police overstop black drivers much more so than white drivers in Vermont. So here what you have is the ratio of the stop rate per 1,000 black drivers divided by the stop rate for 1,000 white drivers. And that number tells you how many times greater is the stop rate of black drivers. So in Pittsburgh, Vermont, black drivers are seven times more likely to be stopped. In Winooski, more than five more times and so on and so forth. You can see here um, the, the, the numbers are pretty high for a lot of them. Killington might be influenced by, for example, tourists coming to ski. So you have to interpret these numbers carefully. But I think that some of th these numbers tell us quite a bit about the racial disparity in stop rates. Now that's really, you know, in, in my view, um, uh, let me just say that for all agencies, the average was 1.78. So black drivers are stopped at roughly almost twice the rate, rate of white drivers, and that's the national average. Um, but really, you know, I think where the telling the results are uh, around traffic stop data are what are the racial disparities in arrests and searches. And let me say this first, that traffic stops are not the only way clearly that the public engages with the police, but it's the most frequent uh, uh, connection, the most frequent experience that citizens have of police. And so if they feel that that experience is not just, if it's not fair, it really reduces confidence in police and trust in the police. It makes it more difficult to do their job. So these issues are, brought, are important, not only for the racial groups that are overstopped, overarrested, and oversearched, but for all of us, it undermines public safety in general. Um, and so why I think that arrest rates and search rates are, are particularly interesting is because we don't really have, you know, we, we don't have precise estimates of the driving population, what percentage is black, so on and so forth. But once a driver has been stopped, we know precisely what the arrest rate is and what the search rate is of each racial group. And so you can see here that in Vermont as a whole, and there are disparities by, by uh, town, that uh, black drivers are, uh, significantly more likely to be arrested subsequent to a stop than are white or Asian drivers, as are Hispanic drivers. And here what you see is the ratio of the black arrest rate to the white arrest rate. So what you see for blacks is they're three and a half times more likely to be arrested subsequent to a stop than white drivers. Uh, Latinx folks are twice as likely to be arrested and Asians are half as likely to be arrested. And I think it's really interesting to, to you know, understand why we see this disparity with regard to Asians. And that is because in US culture, Asians are often perceived to be a, a model minority or honorary whites. And in fact, some police that I've done ride alongs with me have told me that they have actually had, you know, one told me, for example, that he stopped a driver who was Japanese and he, he coded him as his race as white. And I think it, it speaks volumes to the, the stereotypes uh, through which police officers and all of us view, um, view drivers. So um, the, the uh, whoopsie daisy here. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, my slide didn't work, so forgive me. I, I uh, tried to animate my slides and made a mistake, but that's okay. So um, 
darn, not used to doing this on Zoom, sorry. All right, so yes, this is the ratio of the search rate of black drivers to white drivers, which is three and a half times, double for Hispanics and lower for Asians. And one of the interesting things, there's numerous ways to identify bias in traffic stops, right? Disparities don't necessarily mean that there is bias. It could be that one group is, has a different driving behavior than another group. Um, but one of the ways that we assess bias is to look at search rates and to find out whether in fact, drivers who are oversearched are as likely to have be found with contraband. I mean, that's the motivation that the police often give me when they tell me why they are more likely to search black drivers and brown drivers is that they believe that these are the folks that are trafficking drugs, uh, bring them into Vermont. And yet the, the, the data, what the data tell us is that actually black and brown drivers are less likely to be carrying contraband than white drivers. And, and what that infers is that police officers basically use a, a le lower threshold of evidence with which to cert initiate a search of black drivers. So these data, as I said, they give you, this is just a portion of policing, but I think that from these data, we can infer, infer that if there's bias in traffic stops, there's likely to be bias in other aspects of policing. And so I wanna show you some data from Burlington on use of force. We don't have this for all communities, but we do have this for Burlington and I think it would be important to look at it elsewhere. And so Burlingtonians, uh, black Burlingtonians are one in 16, uh, one out of every 16 Burlingtonians is black, but one out of every four people against whom the police use force in Burlington in 2019 were black. Um, this is, I, I would say, an uh, absolutely astonishing disparity. Uh, and uh, in addition to this, one of the things that we find is that uh, black, black uh, use of force victims are also more likely to ha uh, have a gun pointed at them rather than white um, suspects. And this is also from the use of force data in which the police identify what they think is the condition of the person they used force on. And one of the things you'll notice here is that very few of them, a small percentage are under the influence of drugs or perceived to be, and that percentage is lower for blacks and whites under the influence of alcohol, again, lower for uh, blacks than whites. One of the ones that I find very interesting is the difference in identifying a person as being mentally or emotionally disturbed. The, these were, the fact that the police are less half, almost half as likely to identify black suspects as having a mental or emotional um, episode during the use of force incident is very consistent with what we find in many of the other social psychology experiments and in medicine and so forth. And that is that, um, that, that blacks are, tend to be perceived as more criminal, more threatening. Uh, and so you, it, I think that influences the perception of the officer that rather than seeing a person who is mentally or emotionally disturbed, they simply see a threatening person when that person is black. Whereas with a white person, they're better able to identify whether they have mental health issues. So I wanted to just lay this out uh, as we begin this discussion to just give you a sense of what the racial disparities are today in policing. Uh, and just to say that we didn't find any evidence, I should say very little evidence that there have been improvements in these racial disparities over time. Some agencies have shown some uh, improvements and Vermont State Police is one of them. They worked very hard at this. But in many agencies, the numbers have actually gotten worse with regard to racial disparities. One of the interesting things is that with the legalization of cannabis, we might have expected that that, that might have been one of the motives that we see brown and black drivers uh, stopped and searched more because, again, of the inaccurate perception that black and brown uh, people use and traffic drugs more so than white people, that the evidence doesn't support that. Uh, and what we found is that search rates of all drivers declined once cannabis was legalized, but that the racial disparity continues to exist. Black drivers are still three times more likely to be searched than white drivers. So I will leave it there and uh, come back to you when we get together to talk about what is going to happen in the future, what the process of the future is for addressing these issues. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Sarah, do you want to chime in here? 
Um, I think the one thing, hello everybody, um, thanks for having me. And I'm Sarah George, I'm the state's attorney in Chittenden County. Um, I think that the one thing I would just want to quickly add to Professor Seguino's um, slideshow there is that when we talk about these disparities in policing um, and how she said that if bias exists in traffic stops, then bias is going to exist elsewhere. And that is certainly true for the criminal legal system. Um, the more people that are disproportionately searched or the more people that bias is um, presenting against, those people are gonna have more cases coming to us um, for review for criminal charges. And when we're getting cases, we're not aware often until a lot of the work that these reports have shown, we really weren't not just aware, but like told, really shown like actual data that showed that the police departments in our state are over policing black and brown people, which will automatically mean that we are over prosecuting black and brown people because that we're all a part of the same um, timeline, the same process. So I think that um, without real interventions that are at the police level, it's really hard not to have that disproportionate impact follow through the entire criminal legal system. Um, there are things that we're trying to do to, uh, you know, to nip some of that, but it really does start at a ground level with policing. And I can certainly go into the things that we're, we're trying to do here to um, counter that, but I don't know if this, this is please, the time please. for that. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, in Chittenden County, uh, like Professor Saxon said, we have about a third of the state's population. Uh, so we do have a, a, a very large number of the criminal cases that exist in Vermont. And I think as a prosecutor and as a reform, you know, quote unquote reform or progressive prosecutor, we have always, since I've been here, tried to divert more cases and um, send more cases to diversion. And we've certainly tried to limit the number of cases that we are, you know, the people that, how many people are incarcerating. But I think what I have tried to do beyond that is get out of this idea that we need to just divert low level cases and instead start to talk about not charging low level cases, about really just not bringing those criminal charges at all. Um, declining them, sending them back to the communities to address whatever harm may have been caused, or more importantly, um, address whatever issue that particular individual is dealing with, which is usually just basic needs, um, and trying to meet those basic needs so that they don't continue committing low-level offenses. Because as soon as you charge a case, even if you're diverting it, even if you're sending it through some alternative program, you're still charging that case and not only is it an incredible amount of resources that are spent on even the lowest level of cases, but the outcomes are not good. We, do, we really don't have great outcomes within the criminal legal system. So the, the processes that can occur within communities like restorative justice processes, for example, have significantly better outcomes, not just for the individual who's committed the crime, but for the victims if there is one. Um, there's statistics that say that victims who go through our typical criminal process, I think are 8%, 8% of them are satisfied with the outcome. Whereas if that same case goes through a restorative justice process and never comes through the legal system, they're 88% um, satisfied satisfaction with the system. Sarah, there's a question in the chat <clears throat> asking you if there's any data and how often uh, people of color are offered a pre-charge restorative justice process as opposed to whites? No, the, the answer is no, there isn't. And so I was going to get to that too, that, that one, the police actually do have, especially now, I think that at the, at the force of um, Professor Seguino and the legislature, they are starting to have pretty good data and um, ways to extract that data. The Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs does not. Um, we have a program called Justware, and I think the Defender General's Office uses the same one. Um, we can input 
quite a bit of data, um, but it's nearly impossible to get it out. And a lot of the work that we do in the legal system isn't as easy as just entering something in or, or doing using a click down. You know, there's a lot of factors that are involved in offers that we make or, you know, when evidence changes, our offer may change or things get su suppressed. It's, it's actually quite hard to extract that data in a really meaningful way. Um, but no, we don't have those numbers. And um, I do know that nationally, there is a lot of evidence that says that victims who are white, when the person who committed the crime is black, are much more likely to want a more severe sentence, want a more severe punishment against that person than when it is a white defendant and a white victim. And so we are trying to be very cognizant of that, not just in our restorative justice approach, but also our treatment court, um, our probation terms, our incarcerative sentences, any, anything that we are offering as an outcome, being aware of those situations when there might be a black person who committed a crime and the victim is a white person um, and trying to, trying to mitigate that whenever we can. But I think it's the most important thing that prosecutors can do is just limit the number of cases coming into the system at all um, across the board. Because if you do it across the board, you are, by the, by the very nature of that decision, you are going to limit the number of black and brown people that are coming in. Um, further in Chittenden County, we eliminated the use of cash bail. That um, in itself will drastically reduce the number of black and brown poor and, and homeless people that are in our jails. Um, so again, by, by making a sort of blanket decision like that, you will automatically um, hopefully swing that scale the other way for black and brown people. Um, and just having far less conditions of release, far less conditions of probation, far less convictions in general. Um, especially with COVID, we have so much time where cases are pending that we're spending a lot of time just working with defense attorneys to have people do particular things while we're all kind of just waiting around for the courts to reopen, have them going to counseling, have them doing community service if they can, have them doing whatever might be safe for them to do, and then not requiring a conviction, um, dismissing the case, expunging it from their record. Um, any anytime you can limit the number of people coming in and limit the number of convictions or supervision that they have down the road that is automatically going to benefit um, the people of color that we have in Vermont and everybody. Even though we don't have um, the statistics from county to county as to, you know, prosecutors charging, um, is the way that you're suggesting to limit some of the numbers coming in is that the prosecutor will not charge, even though the police officer may be bringing a case or is it the police officers are not going to be charging? No, yeah, so it, so here I'll give an example. In 2019, um, the Chittenden County office declined to charge about 315 cases, either because we didn't think there was probable cause or it was just too de minimis of conduct that we just decided it wasn't necessary. Um, and in 2020 through COVID, we declined over 1400 cases. And most of those were just because we didn't, they did not need to take up our space and our resources and our time in this office. And so the police sent them and asked us to charge them. Most of them had probable cause. It wasn't that there wasn't probable cause, but they were a lot of low level retail thefts or unlawful trespasses at businesses or DLSs, people driving without suspended licenses because they were trying to work. You know, those those types of cases that we would typically divert, we just declined to charge for the sole purpose of not having more cases backed up in a courthouse that is already backed up. Um, and so we're trying to find ways of just putting all those back into communities and having communities lift each other up so that, you know, the, the legal system doesn't have to do it because we're not very good at it.
had a little trouble on you. <laughs> um, there was another question, which is, do we think that there are or no? Wow, I just turned off my phone. Um, do we know if there are a higher percentage per capita of police officers in Vermont than in other states that might account for all these small towns overcharging, over searching? Do you know, Stephanie? I don't know. Oh, you're muted though. I'm, mute. <laughs> I'm just gonna venture a response in terms of Burlington. I don't know at the state level and that would be interesting actually, uh, and I will look into it, but many of you have heard about the uh, resolution to reduce the number of police officers in Burlington and the analysis that that decision was based on um, basically compared Burlington to other cities or towns that had a university, um, had a, you know, you know, controlled for the, the violent crime rate and so on and so forth. And so Burlington um, had, was, uh, the number of officers was literally 30% higher than the median of this set of towns that were very similar in many different ways in terms of the need for policing. So that's the only evidence that I have is, is Burlington itself. And it would be interesting to actually do a comparison nationally. You have another question. Um, it's great that victim satisfaction is high with restorative justice, but are there disadvantages to it? How often is it used? Should it be used more? I guess that's for you, Sarah. Yeah, um, so I, I am incredibly passionate and very biased about restorative justice. I teach, I started a program at Champlain College around it and I teach it. Um, I have never seen a process that works better for, for healing harm and for, you know, essentially mediating um, harm and trauma between parties. And the accountability that is required in a restorative justice process far outweighs anything that our criminal legal system ever requires of an individual. If you go to a change of plea where somebody pleads guilty and you know goes through the entire coll uh, colloquy with a judge and a victim gets to say whatever they'd like to say, if you compare that um, to what an individual has to say or account for in a restorative process, um, it really is, there's no comparison. Um, are there disadvantages? I haven't found any yet other than um, resources. I mean, if we could, t I mean, even the mere fact that the, the resources for most of our restorative justice programs in Vermont come from the Department of Corrections budget, which in itself, I just think is terrible. Like that money should go directly to communities so that they can build up these programs on their own without having the Department of Corrections be involved. Um, but they don't have enough. And especially, you know, I send so many cases through a restorative justice program, which they, they appreciate and they want, but they need, they need more resources. Um, and how often is it used really depends on the county. We use it for really serious cases in Chittenden County. And I know a lot of counties only use it for kind of low level offenses, but it's actually proven to work much better the more serious um, cases that it's used for. And yes, I think it should be used more. Um, it's actually prohibited by statute to use it in domestic violence or sexual violence cases, um, which I would actually like to change because having done the domestic violence docket here um, for four years before I became a state's attorney, um, I think that it would be just an incredible use of that process. It is not for every case. Um, and the people that do it would have to be specially trained in the power and control dynamics involved in a, in a domestic violence relationship. But again, the research is very clear that it works so much better than anything that we have in our current system. Um, so I think that's something that's in the works. I know that uh, Hartford, um, Windsor County in Hartford, it has a pilot program around um, DV, using restorative justice in DV cases. So hopefully that will um, play out in a way that the research says it will, but we don't really um, know yet. Um, 
So the next one I see there is what does RJ require the offender to do? Um, it requires them to take account of, take responsibility for whatever harm they committed. Um, so it's the victim doesn't have to be involved. They can be, or they can send somebody in their place, but it's community members, the person who committed the crime and the person harmed. And they literally sit in a restorative circle and talk about how the crime impacted them. The victims can ask them whatever questions they want. They have to be accountable. They have to answer them. Um, most questions are, why did you do this? You know, that's what most victims want to know. And they want to know that it's not going to happen again. Um, which again, our legal system doesn't require them to ever answer those questions. And a lot of victims never get those answers. So, and then there's usually a conversation about what that victim wants them to do. Sometimes that's community service somewhere. Sometimes it's just a conversation with them. Sometimes it's counseling. Um, they can come up with a plan and the person has to follow through and do what's asked of them. Um, would the speakers feel comfortable giving their opinions on the Burlington resolution from Monday night? I don't know what resolution that is. Do you know, Professor Seguina, from Monday? Uh, the, oops, the police chief had asked for, uh, to raise the cap uh, for the number of officers from 74 to 84. The council turned that down, but did approve hiring um, 12 new people who are community service liaisons, which would be people that would respond without guns to low level incidents like noise violations, um, possibly traffic stops, things like that, as well as some community uh, service officers. I may have gotten the, the nomenclature backwards, but those would primarily be social workers. So I personally, first of all, I, I, I'm on the police commission. So I, just to say that, and we've deliberated on this as well, but I will say this, that when the resolution was passed this past summer, there was also an agreement that the city would hire consultants to actually help the city understand what was the ideal size of the, the police force and what services could better be undertaken by other agencies, other types of services. And the, the contract has been awarded and that is likely to be done by early April or mid April. So I think one of the considerations was that it was premature to ask to raise the cap, just as we're about to spend $100,000 to answer the question about, should we raise the cap? Um, but the other is, I think, profoundly important. We, we're really at a moment, I think, in this country with regard to a change perspective on the criminal justice system, aside from the issue of race, although race has really brought this to the fore. And that is that we're moving from a world in which we understand criminal justice as punitive, that we punish people for their behavior, and rather that we have a deeper understanding of different practices like restorative justice, that we, un we now more deeply understand the role of trauma that influences people's behavior, uh, that is not because they're bad people, but because they have experienced certain things that are caused them to dysregulate. And so uh, I think taking, uh, you know, having pol a police who are on patrols, but who do not carry guns, who are better able to engage with people, and hopefully they will hire people with those social skills, as well as social workers, is precisely the direction we want to move in. Uh, so I, 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 that would be my opinion about the outcome of the resolution. I think it was mistimed since we haven't yet heard from experts who would help us look at, at what we need. And also I think it's most definitely just a, a really um, welcome move in the right direction with regard to treating behavior, which is often criminalizing poor people as well as people of color, in, treating them in a different way that is much more evolved from what we know from brain neuroscience in recent years and just our evolving ethics and mor morals around policing and public safety. Um, <clears throat> we have a question here, um, and maybe any of the three of you can answer this, and maybe Rebecca would like to chime in at this point. Uh, are there successful strategies we're working on here in Vermont, uh, or that others have had success with? 
So what? hello, I, am I unmuted? Good. I, I'm uh, Rebecca Turner and I'm coming from the perspective of a public defender, uh, defense attorney and technically a public defender. I, I work, um, my work in the Office of the Defender General in Vermont comes from the perspective more statewide um, because we handle all of the appeals from criminal convictions, juvenile delinquencies, uh, ch uh, child welfare, termination of parental rights cases, all of that um, from the entire state. And um, also in position, I, I've been put on several sort of various government stakeholder committees uh, and testified the legislature on whatever initiatives. And so where I'm going to go with, I love this question, which is what are we, what strategies are we working he, on here? Successful strategies, not just any strategies. I love this. Like, I love the focus. So, so what successful strategies are we working on here in Vermont? This is the question that haunts me and keeps me reading and digging and going to the last pages of all these brilliant books that are coming out for like the solutions, right? Um, because the important great work that uh, Dr. Sanguino keeps doing and, and her latest report confirms, I mean, it's extraordinarily disturbing to me, her latest report and those slides and the data she just showed. To me, some of the most disturbing is when she pulls in the comparative national analysis. We know it's been bad in Vermont. Last year when we did this, we had that same racial disparities results with traffic stops in Vermont. We know disturbingly a year later, things have not changed. Now we know how much hard, it's just incredible here in Vermont. So, so and, and if we wondered it, we certainly now know, and, and this past summer, what's different from a year ago when we last met? COVID, but just the, the, racial, um, the racial injustice crisis, the murders and, and how much it just built to this national awareness that came here to Vermont. So when I think about successful strategies, to me, there is nothing that we can accept as successful unless it goes after institutional racism and structural racism. And so to me, it's been um, actually at the forefront of a panel I'm on and, and Anna talked about it at the beginning, which is the racial disparities advisory panel, which is uh, a creation of the legislature and, and I'm, that designated for the Office of Defendant General and there are representatives from all the various government agencies, corrections, pro prosecutors, attorney generals, DCF, and community members, uh, BIPOC uh, representatives from all over the state. And we're sort of tasked broadly with, can you help identify and offer up solutions? And one of the most controversial at the very beginning of, of this RDAP was how to, how to talk about this. Is this bias? Is this implicit bias? Is this explicit racism? Is this individual racism? Is this institutional racism? Is this structural racism, right? Is this white supremacy? That is the problem. Because I think critically to get to the successful strategies, we have to understand what the problem is. And I think where we are now a year later is phenomenal in terms of this ability to go to the legislature and say white supremacy and this Vermont's criminal and juvenile justice system is a reflection of this structural racism and not have that just thrown back at you is, is a change for the good because that is where the problems are and, and it is a term we, we toss around but I want to share how I understand it which is through this intersection of Again, it's, it's bigger than individuals, uh, uh, individual biases, right? It's where practices and policies and laws combine um, to perpetuate and, and cultural, um, cultural biases and racisms and attitudes combine to just keep it going. And so when we're focused on just the criminal juvenile justice system, and I know the focus here is on law enforcement and that angle of it, um, what are that, we got to the summer and, and then we got a specific request from the legislature, which is we have this data on traffic stops that um, Dr. Singway has been working on, but we don't have much else. We don't have required production of data sharing or collection. 
uh, anywhere else? And um, should we do it? And if so, what kind of data should we collect? And what, for what purpose, right? I think a lot of the motivation initially was maybe to confirm or deny whether there was racism in this system. I think now the, the, the understanding is no, there is. These numbers that you are hearing about, who's inside, who's outside, just looking at proportionality and ratios of who, who lives um, BIPOC of color outside and who's inside is very, is, is disturbing. Um, in terms of, of the disparities there. So then the, then RDAP sort of took it upon itself to say, well, where is, what should we practice, focus on? Is it number, you know, is it number of arrests? Is it this or that? And what we started realizing was that every point of the system where discretionary decisions were being made was an opportunity for racism to come in. And, and because those decisions were being made by humans, bringing in their own um, race, racial biases, explicit, implicit. And we realized that if we could identify every point and not just from arrest or initiation of, of, a, of, a, of a juvenile delinquency um, or a charge, but initial encounter with someone who got them to, got this kid before, a, um, a judge, right? And it wasn't necessarily the, the police. It could have been a mandatory reporter. It could have been a, a, a teacher, a counselor, and, and they were required to report, right? We wanted to track from there all the way to assuming it didn't get deferred, the case, and they got a, a, a disposition, um, a sentence, and then they were in custody, in state custody, and then could they finish? And then Ultimately, could they get this record expunged? Who was getting all the way those decisions? Um, and so it turned out there's quite a many, quite a few <laughs> pages and pages, and it was this very painful process where we just kept going and going and, and building, and we just didn't want to stop because what was profoundly difficult to to really absorb. I mean, it was clear just going through the exercise of just identifying all those potential decisions, how much the compounding effect of it led to where we are now. Um, and so when we realized that, oh, well, actually, uh, legislature, we recommend that you collect data at all of these points, right? <laughs> and again, some examples and, are from, you know, decision to call the police, the police arrive, how do they respond to the scene? Do they, do they let someone go? Go, or do they do they cite them? Do what kind of cite? Do they arrest them? Bring them into full custody? Or do they release them pending arraignment? Or do they sit in jail once they're in arraignment? Are, are the prosecutors what type of charges are they bringing? Uh, or for juveniles, what kind of um, you know similar things? What kind of offenses are being charged? And who's getting out on bail? Uh, are there plea deals going on? On and on and on. So. When we realized all of these decisions, um, we thought oh, we should recommend some prioritization. Because <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a huge effort. This is the reality is what we found is that, that all of this isn't being collected, um, although some of it was. And, that, and, and, and Sarah talked about how hard it is to extract this data in some of our, our, our databases. We may have similar ones, but they don't talk to each other. Um, and so what's going on in Chittenden County and, and what Sarah is doing, um, we can hear what other prosecutors are doing in other counties, but how much can we quickly extract and, and, and analyze and compare, right? And so for us, it became this important critical tool to not just know where things were happening, but then to compare and really see where the disparities were happening there. Um, but we just decided to recommend the front end of those decision makings because we thought, again, as Sarah sort of instinctively is identifying how can you how can you make decisions that will have the greatest impact, it is at the beginning side of it. Because if you can stop cases from entering in, then you can cut off the compounding effect of having people stay in um, their systems. In any event, um, we are we 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 spent um, a lot of time building up towards that list and um, and filed that report of recommendations to the legislature in December, and so they have started us uh, this session um, 
we're working towards getting the bill introduced to get that kind of data collection. Um, but hopefully that is such a small piece, isn't it? It's just a part of like, to me, that's, that's, that's not a successful strategy. It's a successful, it's, it's the beginning to get a strategy because it's in to understand what to do about it. Um, so that doesn't answer the question, but it, it is a beginning. Um, there are lots of ideas on how to do it. Uh, I think to Sarah and Stephanie, back questions to you. Um, how do we, how do we get what you're doing, Sarah, or how, how is there communication in terms of, of, of generating these ideas beyond Chittenden, right? Whether it's at the prosecutor's level. My, my, my vantage point is that I see a lot of differences in practices. There was a question earlier about the downside of restorative justice or who, who is going in. Do we have race data? One of the collection points we wanted to know was who was getting referred. Who was making the referral? What was the race of the prosecutor making the referral? Who, what was the race uh, or ethnicity of, of the kids or adults who are getting referred? And that's just one part of it. Who gets accepted once they're referred by the prosecutor? Who gets accepted into these programs? Who is actually the accepting person? What is the race of that person? And not only that, once you're accepted, who's actually completing these diversion programs, right? What we are hearing anecdotally, all of this is anecdotally, um, is that it is very hard if someone is referred by a prosecutor to still get accepted into a program if the person who's in the programming is uncomfortable with, with, with the person who's being referred. Now, uncomfortable, again, like what is the basis for being uncomfortable? Uh, and, and, and if we have data to look at if that's playing out on interracial uh, lines, that will be... Um, a way we can check that. Again, transparency, accountability will come with the data, uh, I hope. And we can check that. There's a question yeah. for Sarah. Sorry. Who gets to determine who gets into RJ for, you know, is it just the prosecutor? Yeah, I mean, so police can refer cases directly to their local restorative justice program. Um, and actually community members can, you know, we had a neighbor dispute that the neighbors went themselves to the local restorative justice program and asked if they could partake um, in the program. So that can happen, um, but it's rare. Um, police are getting better and better, at least in Chittenden County, because they're sick of us just sending it back to them to do it. So they are getting a little better with practice of, of immediately doing it. Um, but if that's not happening, then yes, it is up to the individual prosecutor who gets that case on any given day and is deciding what to charge, if to charge and what to do with it. Um, and you know, to Rebecca's point, and I would just say generally that prosecutorial discretion is a shield and a sword. I mean. It is my greatest power and the reason I can do a lot of the really, in my opinion, good stuff that we can do in Chittenden County, um, that same discretion can be used and has been used for decades to destroy people's lives. I mean, that's, that's the reality of prosecutorial discretion. It can be used for incredible good at dismantling systemic racism, um, but it has, it is the reason that we have the the system that we do. Sarah, how can people in other communities determine what their state's attorney is doing in terms of restorative justice, et cetera? How do they know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I am very vocal about the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and I know a lot of state's attorneys aren't, and that's, you know, each to each their own, I suppose, but they are still elected officials. so. Um, just like you would a city councilor or you would a state rep, they are they work for you. Um, so I would certainly suggest reaching out to them and asking them what they're doing. Um, unfortunately, you know we just struggle as a department, and this is not any individual state's attorney's fault. We struggle as a department to extract the data that people want, and I want it, and a lot of the state's attorneys wants it want it. So. Um, it's easy in some ways for us to sort of say like, well, I think I'm doing a good job, but 
I don't actually know. I mean, even in Chittenden County, like I don't really know if what I'm doing is working, um, which I think is ultimately why just keeping cases out of the system, because then there's less data I have to worry about. Um, and we can just, you know, let the police data speak for itself or restorative justice data. Like a lot of the other organizations that we work with have great data. Um, and I know that it's just the program that we have right now is, it, it is capable of doing that, but we don't have the resources as a department to keep it up when they require um, million dollar upgrades every year or whatever it might be. Um, and so I, I think ideally meeting with your state's attorney and just asking them, you know, what are you, what are you doing? And if you aren't happy with those answers, start talking to your community members about that, what accountability looks like. Um, they are elected officials. We are elected officials. And that is part of our job to answer those questions. So I wondered if each of the three of you can talk about recommendations for next steps, sort of, is there anything specific that you could see is that we should be doing or try to do? Um, I can jump in there. Uh, my connection is a little bit unstable, so I might freeze my apologies. Uh, somebody popped in the chat an article by me. I actually think, I thought it was a great article and I think it gives um, a points to directions. One, you know, that both um, Sarah and Rebecca have talked about is data is what is gonna guide us in this, what's working and what's not working. Um, the, the, the data is useful for policymakers, but it's also useful for community members because that's the only way that community members can hold their local agency accountable. There's no really, except for the Vermont State Police, it's not as if municipal agencies are um, monitored, if you will, or beholden at the state level. It's really the community that uh, needs to do that. And so I'll just give you some examples of things that have worked. One is that, that Neil Gross talks about is ending pretextual stops. The Oregon State, uh, in the Supreme Court banned pretextual stops. Pretextual stops are those stops in which the officer um, uses one of thousands of traffic rules as a pretext for stopping you to get a look inside the car. And often it's based on suspicion or hunch. And we know that suspicion is much greater for black and brown people. And that if we could end pretextual stops, we would reduce at least You're freezing. Um, All the time with your stories. And just today, somebody called me, a white woman whose husband is black, who in Chittenden County was pulled over by a female police officer because her back light was just not bright enough on her car, on his car. I mean, and we hear these stories all of the time. So pretextual stops is one way. Another is, you know, I think it's it, that it, what we see at places like Vermont State Police, which is actually trying to make some progress, is that they use the data to, um, to it, with their officers. Uh, so they will show their officers, you know, if they have high stop rates or high search rates of black, how they compare to others. So it's like an internal early warning system, if you will. And I don't know that much can be done at the state level, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, I think that that's the direction that we need to go is that officers need to become more aware of their behavior. Just as, you know, Sarah George said that in her office, even though they're conscious of the work they're doing, you don't really see the patterns in the decisions you make unless you have data that summarize what your actions Oh, Stephanie, we're losing you. That was put out uh, that yeah. all departments would have to do it here. Stephanie, your sound is really freezing up. Um, well, can I can I piggyback off of what she recommended? I love that she she turns she turns substantive, changing some of the laws that sort of perpetuate. And, and she talked about the proxies that the. the proxies to say traffic stops, right, and prohibiting those. And, and certainly that that can be in terms of recommendations that that I would suggest, you know, Sarah suggested, you know, holding state's attorneys accountable through elections. And, and I would just add the legislature too, 
uh, contact your representative and, and senator and let them know that these are important and that these are the types of changes you want. Uh, but we could go a long way with just changing the legal standards for what it takes to stop or really, um, really put consequences to bad behavior. So we don't just rest on a prosecutor's discretion or a police officer's discretion to not arrest, to not charge. Well, if it comes out through litigation that that stop was a proxy for racism, that that stop was otherwise illegal, then that you, you, you have that stopped. You have that suppressed and thrown out. Uh, there is, uh, Roundup is looking into um, whether or not we wanna make some recommendations on what basic standards should be for a civilian oversight board. Um, I know that uh, Stephanie here is, is involved in the, at Burlington um, and others in the community around the state are RDAP. I think we'll be looking at whether or not there's a role for a state level uh, versus a community-based one. Um, again, and looking at the pros and cons of various civilian oversight boards across the country and figuring out what is the best fit um, here. Um, again, from my perspective, Really the key is, is independence. If you're gonna have a civilian oversight board looking and reviewing uh, police behavior, uh, then you really do need it to have independence to be able to, um, to assess and then be able to discipline. Um, all of that requires a lot of finances and um, whether local communities can actually finance something like that or whether it should happen at the state level and pull all of those. Um, maybe that's something to look at, but there are a lot of exciting initiatives that are happening around the country and that we can do here, but also demand from our elected officials. In the article that um, Stephanie's talking about uh, from the New York Times, you know, we can fix the police. Um, he suggests three things. And I asked my law students to read the article and tell me which of the three they really like. And so far, the majority is transparency. Uh, we don't know who's stopping too many. You know, it's back to the data and and the citizen knowledge. Um, so I, I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, you guys are going to make it happen somehow. Mm -hmm. I just jump in on that. That this issue came up in the police commission in Burlington recently because we're passing, we're looking at a policy to require that an officer's past disciplinary uh, records be made public. Right now, as I understand it in Burlington, the police union contract purges any discipline after one year. Um, we, we would like to have that discipline made public I think also one of the issues, one of the major issues is officers who have been fired or forced to leave a department because of misconduct. Um, there's not necessarily decertification and they can get a job at another agency. So that's a place where I think transparency is very, very important. It's a difficult situation because <clears throat> police union have arbitration in their contracts. So if they get sanction for something and they don't agree with it they go to arbitration the outcome of arbitration and is uh private it's not uh you know it's completely confidential as are personnel records currently in vermont so that's a huge area um where transparency might um i don't know how but be opened up Anything else from our learned people? I just, I, I don't want to leave the question lingering in the chat, but I, you know, there's a question about the refiling of the Veronica Lewis case, which is obviously very personal to me. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. I think that there's a, there's a serious balance there in that particular case about whether it's institutional racism or our insistence on criminalizing mental health and disabilities. Um, it could be either, it could be both, um, or it could be neither. I, you know, I, that question is more for our attorney general than it is for me, but I, I certainly appreciate the comment because it's not lost on me for sure. Anything else? 
any next steps that we're going to take. Stephanie, if you're still with us, um, any additional steps that Burlington's going to take? Well, I, I guess I, you know, my world has changed by joining the police commission. So I feel like I'm going to shift now to my police commission role from the researcher role. And that is, you know, being on, on a, a commission, which is not really a truly civilian oversight board and learning firsthand what the complexities are of that. I mean, it is an opportunity for the police to hear from the community from people who represent community values about how they feel that policing should be done, what public safety should, be look, should look like. But the structure of that relationship can be one in which people are, who are the commissions are silenced, are not listened to, um, or many other things. You know, the information that we get is determined by the chief. We don't actually know the full range of information sometimes. And so the ability to provide oversight is really a function of what that structure looks like. Uh, but I, I think that, that that is an important direction to go, to have community input. Uh, but I have learned just in a few short months just how complex that is, especially in smaller towns where um, civilian oversight boards really are, the, the town is so small that it doesn't make sense to have a an independent board that has its own lawyers, its own investigators, conducts its own investigations and so forth. What we really, you know, the size of our towns in Vermont suggests that we would have a review type of civilian oversight board in which the chief makes recommendations around discipline or, you know, complaints and so forth. And the, the civilian oversight board approves or disapproves it, sends it back to be reconsidered. But as I said, that relationship is not one in which the civilian body actually has the power to make independent decisions because it doesn't have its own independent expert support. And that's really the only way that it can work is you have to have an arm's length relationship with the police chief and the police department in order to render an independent decision. So I think it's an important way to go. And you know, we're in the process of learning how to do that here in Vermont. I would just add to that um, S-124 Act 166 last summer or fall, the legislature passed legislation, um, a huge piece relating to a lot of these issues, but specifically assigned the Attorney General's office to consult with whoever um, on what on um, the question of civilian oversight boards. And so perhaps um, this organization might want to reach out and share thoughts there. And I know that that is a process that is getting started now. Um, and so I'm happy to connect um, people with, with the contacts there if that's an interest. Certainly RDAP would take any, any and, and would love to receive and hear anything. Uh, we're taking that up on our next month's agenda. This has been a very interesting discussion and I've learned a whole lot. And um, the slides um, from Professor Seguino, um, will they be available outside of the recording. I'd be happy to share the PowerPoint with you if you'd like to post it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And yes, there's a question. Will this recording be available for people who aren't here? Yes, and Michelle will explain how that is gonna happen, but I assume it'll be on the website for the library. It um, will it'll be on the Kelly Covered Library Adult Programs page, and I'll put the link in the chat so you can know where that is. Yes, and in the chat are, you know, the really interesting um, oh, studies, the Brattleboro study, which we didn't talk about at all. And I think the next panel uh, next month may be uh, focusing on that. But it looks like a number of towns are very interested in the issue of the community and the police and how to work with, you know, together. Um, but I'm excited to hear that, you know, Burlington's leading the charge um, and maybe Brattleboro too. And we'll see what happens next. 
other questions for our panelists. This is your chance. Last words from the panelists. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, 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 you know, I will just, you know, I'd be happy to say a few things. You know, I've really been deep into this and, and um, I, you know, I feel like we are at a political moment and that we have to seize this moment. Uh, the death of George Floyd really, I think brought into relief that policing has changed in the United States. I don't know if, you know, many of you don't, maybe not, don't know this, but my father used to be a police officer and policing was very different um, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, there was an interesting book that I think encapsulates what we've seen in general. And that is the book is called uh, The Rise of the Warrior Cop. Uh, there has been, I think uh, many people expressed to me in Vermont, this uh, experience of police being militaristic, sort of warrior-like and adversarial in an us against us versus them stance. Um, there are one of the causes of this has been identified is the, the returning veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq who are trained in a particular way and have brought that into policing. A task force last fall in Burlington uh, sought to determine what percentage of Burlington police officers were returning vets from these, um, from these places and 30% are. Uh, and so uh, I think, you know, we are at a moment that, as I mentioned, we have this brain neuroscience re research on trauma that is changing things. We are changing our ethics around uh, that moving from punishment to rehabilitation as a country. I think that we're doing that. The recent video of George Floyd demonstrated to us um, the worst excesses of the police and their lack of accountability when it comes especially to black and brown people. And I, I don't wanna suggest that the police are worse than the rest of us. We all have bias because we've drank the cancerous water that this country uh, that dis has distributed for the last 400 years. But policing uh, is a life and death uh, endeavor and can ruin lives, not only through being killed, but also ruining job opportunities, breaking up families, uh, leaving children childless and so forth. And so I just would say to everybody that th we are in a political moment. This moment will disappear. And we need to take every opportunity we can in the coming year or two to make these changes, to push these changes through. And I would be the first person to tell you that it's not easy and that the backlash sometimes is very tough to deal with. Um, and, that, and yet, uh, those of us especially who are white, have an obligation to do this work. Last words, Sarah. Ditto. I mean, that. <laughs> I thank you for saying that. I think that that's exactly right. Um, I have. I feel the same way. I think that this is our this is our opportunity. Um, there is so much demand on us right now to do this, especially leaders um, who are white. Um, it's, it's our obligation. This is not the obligation of people of color to educate us and fix this. This is our problem that we got ourselves into. And, and I say that as a white woman and as a prosecutor, um, that we got ourselves into this. And um, it's, it's not, you know, I, people often say that the system's broken. And I really try to push back on that because the system's not broken. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And that was to continue um, slavery in a very, in a, in a different way, um, in a systemic way. And so we need to break down this system. We need to dismantle it. We need to build communities up. And now is a time that everybody is really talking about that. We really have to do it. Um, Vermont is second in the country for the most disproportionate number of black and brown people in our jails. Um, so we are, we are not doing a good job. And I think Vermont on a lot of things likes to think that we're different. And not only are we not different, we're second worst. That means we are worse than Texas. We are worse than New Orleans. Those are things we do not want to beat those jurisdictions in. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. And I think demanding it from any elected official that you possibly can is a really great start and not stopping until they actually do what you are asking them to do, or at least promise to do it and give you reasons 
or ways that they're going to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Rebecca, any last words? Oh, the last words. Yes, no, everyone, I can, I love the comments and the set and the, and the polls and the sharing of the hyperlinks. You all have access to the ideas too, and to just make sure that your voice is heard, right? Just reach out and, 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 and it, as you know, just reach out to, to our elected officials and, and, and make it them know that what you support and what you want and what you will not tolerate. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, our wonderful presenters. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you for the League of Women Voters who's been putting on these great panels. Um, so thank you all for coming. I wish I could see you all. Yeah. But thank you, everybody. Good Stay night. Safe. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.